Leslie is the embodiment of the values and aspirations we have for research uh, and for the club as a whole. She's been a City Club member since 1984. She's been a member of the research board since 2003. She's participated in two long-term studies, the Oregon Comprehensive Health Care Finance Plan and the Temporary Increases in Income Tax Rates. You're right, Brian, these are long terms. <laughs> we, uh, she's also been research advisor on Measure 36, the Ballot Measure Study, defining marriage and research advisor on the Health Care Issue Committee. And on top of all this, she managed the 2006 Community Scan and she co-hosted this fantastic Citizen Salon earlier this week. Leslie is a volunteer who is quick to, she's quick to volunteer and she's absolutely depended, dependable and she's deeply committed to civic engage, engagement. So congratulations, Leslie, on receiving this great award. Leslie forgot to read her bulletin, if you can imagine that, so I told her on Tuesday night that she'd won this award, so she better show up. So that's what we were just talking about. Okay. <clears throat> Each year, we have one member that clearly rises above all the rest in his or her own way. We have an outstanding member this year. Our Member of the Year Award for 2007 goes to Brian Campbell. <laughs> Brian seems to have done it all this year. He chaired the research board. He was an integral part of uh, the uh, report on education finance, which was quite complicated. He hosted a citizen salon, he planned an Agora event, and he served on the Board of Governors. Brian has a rich history with City Club and, is apparent, and an apparent love for this organization. He is a steady source of wit, wisdom, and work. Thank you, Brian. And as president, I have the option of presenting a special award to those who have made a significant com uh, contribution to the work of the club. This, were, this year, I have the privilege to honor a person who's shown an incredible commitment uh, to City Club and its mission. The recipient of the 2007 President's Award is John Horvick. I'm gonna talk about you for a minute. John is 27 years old. He is passionate about peop uh, connecting people to the life and the work of the city. He is a member of the Board of Governors. He's been co-chair of the new Leaders, Leaders Council. He serves on the Agora Steering Committee and he's been involved in planning exciting new leadership development program for the, for the club. John is one of our rising stars. He's being honored this year for significantly enhancing the participation of our new leaders. Congratulations, John. And finally, today, we give City Club's highest honor, the City Club Award. This award is given in recognition of a lifetime of service to City Club and to the community. Cities Club's motto is, good citizens are the riches of the city. We, today we honor Ogden Beeman, who is truly one of the great riches of our city. Ogden is a civil engineer. He spent his professional career based in Portland, except for going to graduate school in Holland and a two-year assignment in Seoul, Korea when he was working for the World Bank. Now, if you sat next to Ogden Beeman at City Club Friday Forum, you may not know this, but eventually you would find out that he is one of the foremost experts on navigation in the Columbia River. In fact, you've probably seen his picture in magazines recently. This is one that says, those who have defined our past and also shaped our future. There he is, he's the guy kind of in the middle in the back. <laughs> it's about Port of Portland and the contributions that these three individuals have made. He's credited with a number of innovative techniques which enable large ships to reach the Port of Portland. 
You could also ask him to discuss the comparisons between the Suez Canal, where he worked in 1977, and the Panama Canal, where he's been working in the last five years. Ogden's was, Ogden was founder and president of the Northwest District Association and chair of the District Planning Task Force. This work resulted in the Office of Neighborhood Associations and official recognitions of neighborhoods in the city planning process. And isn't it hard to imagine Portland without that? Ogden has been a member of City Club for nearly 40 years. He served on the research board and as president of City Club. And when he was president-elect, he was working on the Suez Canal, and he shuttled back and forth to Egypt while running the annual fund. So when people say they don't have enough time, I want them to talk to, I want them to, talk to Ogden. <laughs> and even with the demanding career that took him all over the world, uh, Ogden has always found time to give to his uh, community. Uh, his participation and his uh, commitment to City Club, though, has transcended his formal roles. We have looked to him for guidance and wisdom on bigger issues such as uh, our legacy giving program, how to integrate long-term planning with the, uh, with the club centennial. And back in, when City Club was uh, celebrating its 75th year, Ogden, along with Steve Shell, put together a recap of all the major studies that had been done by City Club during the prior 70 years. Finally, Ogden has a book out, which is ready to go to print, and I can't wait, wait to read it, called My Name is Ogden. <laughs> so, Ogden, could you please come forward and say a, a few words? Congratulations. <laughs> Susan, it's dangerous to uh, offer an ex-president the podium. <laughs> uh, I would just like to say a couple of things. One, first of all, it's such an honor and a privilege to serve the club in a leadership role that this is really just kind of the frosting on the cake, and uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, you've already recognized my colleague and. 30 years in the club, Steve Shell, and his work. I would also like to uh, ask Chris Topkin, who was executive director when I was president, to be recognized as she played a huge role in the club. And finally, I would like to say that it's a pleasure to be here on the podium with Susan, who <coughs> I was working with 20 years ago on the Governor's Commission, Don Williams, who served with me on the board 30 years ago, and Jim Zarin, who I caught just off the plane from Minneapolis and recruited him into his first long-term research assignment. Thank you very much. And my last official act as City Club President, I will proceed with the election of officers and governors. First, I'd like to re uh, introduce our returning members of the Board of Governors. They are John Horvick, who is Project Director for the Parents and Children Together Study at OHSU. John will continue as governor and as the liaison to the new Leaders Council. Marge Kafori, is Marge here? Marge is not here. I think, she, well, she's a lobbyist. I think that tells us where she probably is today. She's down in Salem, I assume. She will con continue to serve as a governor. Carla Kelly, right down here. Carla is general counsel of the Port of Portland, and she will continue to serve as chair of the program committee. Chip Lazenby is not here today. Chip is general counsel for Portland State University, and he will continue to serve as a governor. Ron Paul, who is a consultant as a civic entrepreneur, sitting right down here, will continue as a governor and as chair of the Agra Steering Committee. Uh, Larry Wallach, who couldn't be here today, he's dean of the College of Urban and Public Affairs at Portland State University, and he will continue to serve as a governor, and I will continue to serve as immediate past president. So now we will proceed with the election of officers for 2007-2008. 
John Williams, or John, oh, I didn't get his name right. That's the guy with the Boston Symphony. Don Williams, <laughs> Chief Operating Officer for Schwab, Schwabby, Williamson, and Wyatt, will be our president, and he becomes president automatically. Jim Zarin, attorney for Stolries, uh, LLP, is nominated to become president-elect on his immediate left. Why don't you wave so everybody knows who you are, Jim? Sue Thomas, co-founder of Avatar, Inc., automatically becomes first vice president and will serve as chair of the research board. Julie Young, on her right, is a social worker, chair of the club's early childhood advocacy committee, and is nominated to become second vice president of the research board. Sharon Van Sickle, on her right, is chair of the club's Business Environment Study Committee. Sharon is a peony farmer on Savi's Island and she will become our secretary. And Ted Kay, on her right, is Vice President of Finance for Teledirect International, is nominated to become our treasurer and will be chair then of our finance committee. Brian Campbell, who you have met, will continue on the board. He is a land use and transportation consultant. He's nominated to become a governor and chair of the advocacy and awareness board. Adam Davis, who could not be here today, is a partner in the opinion research firm of Davis, Hibbets, and Middall, and is nominated to become a governor. And Elizabeth Riley, down here, is a consultant with the Collins Group, and she's nominated to be governor, and she will chair our membership committee. The above nominees have been selected by the nominating committee according to the bylaws. There is a mechanism in the bylaws which allows for other nominations. There need to be three written recommendations submitted 10 days prior to the annual meeting, and that there have not been any submitted I herefore declare that the nominees are elected by unanimous consent. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. And I also want to thank Bill Kramer, who is right down here, for chairing the nominating committee this year. Finally, I want to take a moment to thank uh, our staff here at City Club. I continue to marvel at the fact that City Club puts on 44 public forums a year, two or three evening events every week. Turns out top quality research keeps track of members, finances, registration, and much more with only five staff people. And we have the following people to thank, and I'd like you, you're most, most of you are back there, I'd like you to stand up so everybody knows who you are. First is Kim McCool, our office manager. <laughs> Second is Mark Moscato, who's over here, our communications coordinator. <laughs> Next is Margaret Eichmann, membership and development director. And Wade Fickler, our policy director. And Wendy Rodmacher Willis, who you will be hearing from soon, our executive director, right here. Larry, we introduced you earlier, but this is Larry Wallach, Dean of the College of Vernon Public Affairs, who will continue on the member as a Board of Governor. You're right down there, Larry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Well, today is my final day as your CVO, your what we call our Chief Volunteer Officer. <laughs> and I think back to when I first became aware of the City Club of Portland. I came to Portland in the early 70s, and I remember seeing uh, pictures in the Oregonian of women standing out in front of the Benson Hotels banging on pans with rolling pins and wearing helmets. And uh, they were protesting the exclusion of women from the City Club of Portland. And it was kind of an exciting and raucous time. Uh, many members, including my mentor and friend, Sid Lezak, who was president of the club at the time, resigned over this. Um, and there were multiple uh, votes to admit women. And finally, in 1974, 
with the uh, persistence of the women banging on the pans and the internal advocacy of many men, uh, the club became a different and more inclusive place. <clears throat> This was in 1974. Um, I was uh, a second year law student at the time, and I could not have imagined <laughs> on that day that some 32 years later I would become president of this old boys club. <laughs> in our 91 year history, we have gone through many iterations that show that we must continue to change and adapt and become a more inclusive and a more vital place. Excuse me. We're still in the process of discovering, as our motto developed in 1916 says, 1916 that is, almost 100 years ago, to inform our members of the community on public matters and to arouse in them the realizations of the obligations of citizenship. And I just love that phrase because I, it's so rare to see the words arouse and obligations in the same sentence. <laughs> in the last few years, we've had a truly amazing leap forward. And I say this with much pride in our members and our staff <clears throat> because I know full well that as a leader, any of us can fail alone. But none of us can succeed alone. I want to highlight just a few of our shared accomplishments. There was a, not, a time not so long ago, and I know most of you can remember it, when City Club was a shrinking and graying organization. In the last year or so, our membership has grown by 365 people. Isn't that poetic? One person a year. Thanks to the efforts of the staff and the members, every ambassador, which many of you are, who have brought someone to lunch, suggested they join, <clears throat> given a city club membership as a birthday gift or as a graduation gift, and it's not too late, you know? Graduations are still coming, so don't forget to do that today. Our new Le Leaders Council has really taken off. Young professionals, many who are not the Friday Forum crowd, are getting to know each other through experiential learning, through discussions, green building tours, excursions to the urban growth boundary, and of course, beer. They're becoming engaged in the life of the city and are getting ready to assume leadership positions. The second role that I think is a, uh, the second thing that I think is a big win for us this year that I want to talk about is about funding. City Club people seem to love politics, love dialogue, love policy, sometimes have less of an interest in figuring out how to keep ourselves afloat economically. I think we've gone through a shift this year that I hope will continue, and that is from thinking of ourselves as a membership organization that lives on dues and on a shoestring to an organization that we each think of as part of our in individual annual philanthropy and part of our investment in the future of this community, part of our legacy. I can't tell you how grateful I am to those of you who have risen to the occasion and really helped make this happen. There's much more I could say about what we've done this year, the research, the advocacy, the outstanding Friday forums, the emergence of Agora, but I will stop here. I am profoundly grateful to have served as your CBO. And I think we have unlimited potential here, and I'm really excited about watching it develop in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, dear. Okay. Well, so now it's my pleasure to introduce you to your new president, Don Williams. You will soon learn, if you don't already know, that you are incredibly lucky to have John as your president next year. 
Don is a very hardworking guy. He is a very funny guy. He is a strategic thinker. He has been a fantastic president-elect this year, chairing the annual fund <clears throat> and in securing corporate uh, uh, sponsorships. Don's been a member of City Club for two years. He served on the research board. He's been on the Board of Governors three times. And Don even has a City Club tattoo, which he might show you if you ask. <laughs> Now, I was asking Wendy today, which seems like kind of a strange thing to ask when you're just going out. I said, do we have a gavel? I was thinking maybe I should give him a gavel, but I've never seen one. And she said, no, we've never done anything like that. So I do have a gift that I can give Don, which are the tools of the trade of a, uh, of a uh, past president or a president, and they are these things. <laughs> I hope you can see this. One minute. 30 seconds and time. So, Don, you get to be a control freak. I'm going to give these to you. Welcome, Don Williams. Actually, I don't have a tattoo, I have a City Club piercing. Prior to last June, I knew Susan Hammer by reputation. I knew she was a skilled trial lawyer and headed the employment group at a large Portland law firm. In 1999, she started her own firm specializing in mediation, and she has received the top, the highest Martindale Hubble Law Directory rating, and in 2006 was uh, voted a Portland super lawyer. Both of these are um, determined by peer evaluation. I also knew Susan was very active in civic and professional activities, often in leadership positions. And some of these included the International Academy of Mediators, the Willamette University Board of uh, Trustees, the past chair of Planned Parenthood. And while she has been City Club president, she's even chaired the Planned Parenthood Capital Campaign. However, little did I know what a strong and dedicated leader she would be as president of the City Club. And when I see the accomplishments that Susan accomplished, I think of them in the context of other just outstanding City Club presidents, including Ogden Beeman, Dr. Fran Storrs, who's sitting over there, Pauline Anderson, and John Schleining, who's sitting at this table. Based on her leadership and other nonprofit organizations, she's talked to us about the need for stable funding uh, for City Club. She initiated the concept of leadership circle giving, which has been a great success and will be a key part of our long-term financial strategy. I might also add that despite incredible due diligence, she has no apparent vices other than an addiction to chocolate chip cookies. Many people don't realize that due to the nature of her practice, her commitment to City Club goes even beyond what is apparent. Susan only missed two Friday forums in her entire year as president. And in order to attend the Friday programs and also the City Club board meetings, she essentially has to clear her entire calendar due to the constraints of her practice for an entire day. When one is a sole practitioner, this is a real commitment and, and means a real impact. Susan, your vision has added tremendous energy and momentum to the club's resurgent. We're also thrilled that you're not going away. You're gonna be around for another year on the board as immediate past president and also working on the club's centennial. Please accept this plaque oh, thank you. and thank you again. Okay. I mentioned that Susan Hammer only missed two Friday forums during her year as president, which is a remarkable record. Both times I gave speaker introductions, and both times I started with a sentence, welcome to the City Club of Portland, Oregon's premier citizens forum. Now I work at a law firm with 150 lawyers who are very smart people. They make their living attacking and analyzing what other people say and write. So the next Monday, one of them who heard the rebroadcast on Oregon Public Broadcast, Oregon Public Broadcasting saw me and said, Don, your use of the word premier, isn't that a pretty bold statement? You know, that's one reason I love working with lawyers. 
It makes one think about each statement before it's uttered or before one hits a send button on an email. In this case, I was very prepared to respond. I said, first, let's look at some synonyms for premier. Two words I would suggest are foremost and preeminent. And yes, if we look at the evidence, the City Club is preeminent. For example, during the last year, the following public officials gave their major addresses at these public officials gave their major addresses at a Friday forum. The governor, Congressman Earl Blumenauer, the mayor, the executive directors of the Port of Portland and Metro, the superintendent of public schools, and both the speaker of the Oregon House and the president of the Oregon Senate. In addition, former Secretary of the Interior Bruce Babbitt and former Governor John Kitzhaber spoke at a joint appearance. We've had programs on the arts, the Portland business climate, energy and transportation, urban planning, and this has included both nationally and internationally recognized speakers. Well, we even had the former Inspector General of the Central Intelligence Agency who addressed a joint uh, meeting of the Portland Business Alliance and the City Club. City Club speakers have been quoted in print media editorials and articles. The defense of my assertion continued, and I went on, but a critical part of the value of the City Club is also the interaction that one has at the Friday forums with other City Club members and guests. They're interesting, they're well-informed, they're diverse, and and to support my statement, I said, at the last two meetings, here are some of the people that I've sat next to. The CFO of a large development company, a young architect, a consultant for nonprofit organizations, a physician, an assistant to Commissioner Dan Saltzman, and a student from the University of Portland. I might add that I am extremely proud to say that that UP student is my daughter, Laura, who joined City Club last April and loves to come to Friday forums. As an aside, for those of you here today, one of the traditions of City Club is to always introduce yourself and shake hands with the people at your table. In fact, we even ask you to put on these corny name tags because it helps stimulate dialogue. And that dialogue is one reason you should also always get to a Friday forum in plenty of time before the speaker starts. For example, today, if you sat next to Ogden Beeman, Susan told you about his work on the Columbia River, the Suez Canal, and the Panama Canal. And with some coaxing, he might even be persuaded to share several of the technical papers on which he lectured in China, India, and Indonesian for the United Nations Development Program. In fact, Charlotte, his wife, told me that he has provided free autographed copies of some of these papers at the back, <laughs> at the back table. Sorry, Ogden, I just couldn't <laughs> resist that one. Or perhaps you might occupy a seat next to former Oregon Secretary of State and Superintendent of Public Instruction, Norma Paulus. And she is a departing board member, as you know. After graduating from Burns High School, Norma became a secretary for the Oregon Chief Justice. Based on a test of her academic potential, she then became the only person to bypass college and go directly from high school to Willamette University Law School. She graduated, passed the bar, and she might be uh, willing to share some wonderful stories about her career, her memorable career in public service. Sitting at another table over there, you might sit next to Dr. Fran Storrs, another former City Club president. Fran is a professor of dermatology at OHSU and a national expert in her field. She could relate how an incident of gender discrimination when she was a young physician in Portland changed her life. It motivated her to champion minority rights and become an outstanding mentor to young physicians and a very active leader in many civic organizations, including the Civil, American Civil Liberties Union and the City Club. But now back to my story. Since he was a litigator, the lawyer I was debating was still not willing to concede. So at this point, I told him about City Club research. I knew that he had read references to the Portland Development Commission, so then I summarized the results of the last year of City Club research, which included the publication of six ballot measures, a long-range study on school funding, and two resolutions. 
I told him about my own experience on the, as a member of the Portland Police and Fire Disability and Retirement Fund study. Our 11 member committee met for seven months before publishing our final report in February 2006. The Oregonian and the Portland Tribune both cited the city club's influence in formulating and ultimately helping pass a ballot measure which reformed the FPDNR. And in fact, both the mayor and two city commissioners publicly recognized the city club and complimented us for our work done at the city council meeting at which they adopted the ballot measure. Passage of this measure resolved a problem that could have been ultimately financial disaster for the city of Portland or even bankrupted the city. At this point, my friend, the lawyer, was due in court, so he gave up, or at least he tacitly agreed with me, and I considered this a victory. In fact, I didn't even have to tell him that next week our speaker is going to be the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. But let me just talk just a little bit more about City Club research. The experience working with my committee is typical of any research group. It led Jim Westwood, who chaired the recent City Club Commission, um, or the City Charter Commission study, to state when he gave his report to the City Club, I've served and chaired many City Club research committees over the year, but never have I had more pleasure working with any group of City Club members. Everyone on this committee is an eagle. In fact, in a subsequent email, which I love and is typical of Jim, he sent, uh, he included this quote, I would trust you to draft a constitution of any country I inhabited. <laughs> I'm fortunate to have joined City Club soon after I graduated from college. In 1972, when I was working on Senator Hatfield's reelection campaign, Oregon icon Jerry Frank suggested I joined and sponsored me. And I'd like to thank Jerry for facilitating a journey in a wonderful organization which I cherish. And by the way, I'm going to continue my introductions with a sentence, welcome to the City Club of Portland, Oregon's premier citizens forum. If you want to debate me, just give me a call. <laughs> and now let's start today's program. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by our terrific corporate sponsors. And please join me in thanking Zimmer Gunsel Frasca and Stoll Reeves. We're grateful for their support. Just one minute and I'll find my introduction to Wendy. <laughs> you know, that's why the people tell me never follow a trial lawyer because Susan uh, lost one of her papers last week, or I think the week before, and just without hesitation continued to go on. I'm not quite as good as she is, but. Go. Many weeks we have at City Club speakers who talk about a current issue. We listen to facts and figures supporting their specific topics. Some will engage in heated dialogue or in heated debates about public policy decisions. Some will talk eloquently about the arts. But today we're privileged to hear a presentation that's designed to make us stop and think. It's a subject which is more abstract, but what subject could be more relevant for City Club members to ponder than civic engagement, especially when the speaker is somebody who feels passionate about it? Our executive director, Wendy Rodmacher Willis, was hired for the position four years ago. She has been a major fourth force in the growth and new dynamics of City Club. She's a native Oregonian 
and attended Thurston High School in Springfield. She then graduated from Willamette, excuse me, from Willamette University and Georgetown Law School. She came to City Club after working for, as a law clerk for Chief Justice Wally Carson and then working as an assistant public defender. Besides civic engagement, two of Wendy's passions are running and knitting. In fact, her family has a motto, it says Wendy's motto is, if she's sitting, she's knitting. <laughs> Wendy's husband, Jonathan, is also a lawyer and they have two young daughters. Wendy can also be seen often riding her bike to work from their home in inner southeast Portland. Please join me in welcoming our outstanding executive director, Wendy Rodmacher Willis. Thank you, Don, and thank you, Susan, and all of you for being here today. Um, thank you for asking me to talk to you. I know it's not something that a City Club Executive Director has ever done before, and I, um, and I recognize the honor of being here, especially in the company of all these people who have done so much for the club and the community. I know that my role usually from this podium is to be cheerleader-in-chief, and we do have a lot to cheer about this year, and I'm sorely tempted to recount for you the accomplishments of the year. I want to tell you about the, the amazing selflessness and resolve that I've seen from all of you and ask you to continue that work, to ask you to continue to support the organization both financially and otherwise, and urge you to bring your friends and colleagues to City Club and to ask them to join as members. And believe me, I am asking you to do all those things. But today, I think this is an opportunity to talk to you about my middle of the night questions. And I, those are the questions that I ask about the very foundation of the work. And I think it's an honor to be able to talk about those questions with you because this is your organization, this is your work. And so if I share my dark middle of the night questions, I hope you'll reciprocate and share your questions with me as well. So let me tell you how I came to these questions. And I'll, I'll tell you a story. Last winter, my husband Jonathan and I and our two young daughters who were just there, um, and four other families rented a cabin in Hood River over New Year's. We stayed for about a week, and amongst us, if you can believe this, there were 10 children between the ages of eight and three. Yeah, and <laughs> partway through the trip, the kids start started this game that they started creating clubs. It started with the older kids, the ones who could write. So they started creating all these sign-up sheets to have people join their clubs, and it was a way of luring others into their games, into their interests. So they did a birdie club and a dog club and a Lincoln Log club and I think, I don't know what all else, but things started to devolve and there were gender specific clubs, robot club and princess club. And it was benign basically for a couple of days. And except for the poor animals who were being chased down as part of the birdie club. But things started to change several days into the trip and there were more tears and more arguments. The kids started to exclude other people from their clubs. You know, things like no babies, no boys. And likewise, some of the children started to refuse to join other people's clubs as a way to, to sort of strategize about who's in and who's out. They started to one-up each other by creating the coolest clubs and trying to make the adults laugh with their cleverness about what the clubs were. And the game soon became entirely about the makeup of, of the club rather than what the clubs did. And the game stopped except for who was in and who was out. Now, I know that what you're thinking, you're thinking because my line of work, this is some kind of creepy human experiment. Um, but it's not, I promise. Um, but it did make me think. Um, and it made me ask, what is City Club? It's a club. And it was an odd experience because on one hand, it's an organization that I know so well and we all know so well and we don't even really think about its nature. We know what it is. Um, but I was able, in the same moment, to hold it both as this venerable organization that's made so much difference in this city and that has a very particular place, but also a sort of oddity. It's a club. And I wondered, is this, this is an organization that has both an inside and an outside. The inside being the members and the outside being basically everybody else. And is that the best way in the scheme of civic engagement to bring people to public life? Is an organization that has an inside and an outside the way that we want to do it? Does a club, by its very nature, create barriers, barriers created by dues and by perception and by the baggage that comes with a long-term organization? 
And if our entire mission is really to break down barriers, are we doing the right thing in, in, in doing it from an organization that has these kinds of intrinsic limitations? And should we, in fact, be trying to dissolve that notion, dis dissolve that kind of notion entirely? So this is a kind of frightening thought, and I wonder um, where the, this line of questioning leaves us. And it's healthy, I think, here today amongst friends to ask it, to question our very nature, to talk about clubhood or clubship or whatever we want to call that noun. Are we hobbled by even the name of the organization? Let me ask this a different way, a, a simpler way. Is, is our mission to engage members and all citizens in public life at odds with the basic structure, that of a membership organization? And it's a good time to ask this question, obviously internally, but also externally at this time when the very notion of association is at a crossroads in the nation, uh, maybe in the world, but certainly in the, this country. And I'll give you some examples of that. Richard Florida, who many of you know, um, who's written extensively about the creative class, talks about how that young, mobile, educated, very desirable class of people associate. This, we hear that the creative class, they have ties, but the ties are loose ones. They're both episodic and also opportunistic. So in other words, people associate for a, for a moment around a project and disappear. And that happens both as a sort of, uh, as a work matter, and, an, and a, but also as a social matter. It's an ephemeral kind of association, and in some sense antithetical to the idea of membership. Many of us also know the work of Robert Putnam, the Harvard political scientist, who wrote Bowling Alone, and he spoke from this podium two years ago. He tells us that traditional civic associations are dying on the vine. The, what he calls the animal lodges, the elks, the lions, are nearly gone. Rotary and Kiwanis are graying and diminishing, and subscri even subscriptions to arts organizations are going down because people don't want to commit to an entire season. They want to commit on a show-by-show -show or um, a concert-by-concert -concert basis. And this all is happening while there's a, a tremendous amount of political science writing about at questioning whether associational activity is in fact an inherent part of democracy at all. So what does that mean for us? Um, where do we fit into the democratic process, especially the democratic process here in Portland? And I think the first question is the obvious one, which is what do we aspire to? What do we as the insiders here aspire to exactly? We know what our mission is, and you've heard it um, at least once today, is to inform our members in the community in public matters and to arouse in them a realization of the obligations of citizenship. Um, unlike Susan, who, who finds the word arouse hard, for me it's obligation. Um, we don't like to talk, uh, we don't like to tell other people what they should be doing with their time. It's hard to even articulate what we think obligations are. But I think we've sort of, we've, we've, we've uh, walked that line here, and I think what we mean by it here most generally is that we want people to have some meaningful participation in self-governance, even if it's small. And I think it's also important for us to turn back to the original sort of Tocquevillian notion of association to remind us of the very specific American tradition that we come from. And forgive me for a moment if this is a bit of a, you know, a recap of a history lesson, but Many of you know in 1832, Alexis de Tocqueville visited the United States um, ostensibly to examine American prisons. And he produced, without question probably, the most um, comprehensive description of Ameri a very you know, nascent American democracy, but also American culture as well. And he was the most precise observer of Americans' tendency to associate, and maybe the very first person to actually point that out, that Americans associate about everything. And by this he means associate outside of the workplace, outside of the market, and outside of government. And here's what, he, here's what he says. Americans of all ages, all stations in life, and all types of disposition are forever forming associations. There are not only commercial and industrial associations in which all take part, but others of thousand different types, religious, moral, serious, feudal, very general and very limited, immensely large and very minute. Americans combine to give fets, found seminaries, build churches, distribute books, and send missionaries to the antipodes. Finally, if they want to proclaim a truth or propagate some feeling by the encouragement of a great example, they form an association. In every case at the head of any new undertaking, where in France you would find the government, or in England some territorial magnet, in the United States you're sure to find an association. He goes on to talk about the fact that in America, where in Europe, a lot of social problems or social questions really 
were solved by the aristocracy. Um, it wasn't, there, no debate was necessary, there was just a sort of monolithic decision-making process. And in a young country without an, aristo an aristocracy that functioned that way, political and civil associations took that place. More interestingly to me though, Tocqueville very early recognized that Americans taught themselves to partic participate politically by association. In other words, citizenship, the, 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 the act of being a citizen, isn't, you're not born with it. In fact, um, it requires practice. We don't innately know how to build consensus or speak our minds or listen deeply to people we disagree with. Americans, Tocqueville concluded, teach themselves and teach one another how to function in a democracy through these small local associations. It's a kind of mentorship system where the work is important but the stakes aren't that high. And then the citizens can take those skills out and use them in, this, in what he saw to be the sort of big uh, politics writ large. And he also, he goes on to say, a political association draws a lot of people at the same time out of their own circle. However much difference in age, intelligence, and wealth may naturally keep them apart, it brings them together and puts them in contact. And here's my favorite quote of anything that Tocqueville's ever said, I think. Once they have met, they always know how to meet again. And you know, this in some ways sounds like an academic exercise, but for any of us um, who have spent very much time at City Club, we recognize it. We see it as grounded in fact. We see it as grounded in what we experience here. We know a lot about the individual benefits. You've heard a lot today about people can talk about their individual benefits of what the work is like here. And there are dozens, probably hundreds of stories of individuals whose civic and political sensibilities were launched here in a, in a city club um, activity. Neil Goldschmidt, who I think is regarded as sort of cradle, a cradle politico, um, will say, in fact, his first real policy experience was on a city club committee. Julie Young, who became chair of the uh, research board today, chaired City Club's early education study and then the advocacy committee. We've all benefited from Julie's work, but she now has emerged as a statewide leader on issues of early childhood, childcare, and education. And she told me I could tell you this. She's even toying with it with the, with the opportunity to run for state legislature in 2010. Caitlin Baggett, who many of you know, who's a 29-year-old City Club member, she's now a full-time political activist. She works for the Bus Project. She'll say that her interest in politics was entirely ignited by her 2002 study experience when she was on the form of government study committee. And there are many, many more stories of individuals who found a vocation or an avocation in public life because of something that was sparked here. But we also find in this work, and this is what I find fascinating, real benefit to the community that happens in collective work. And by that, I don't just mean the work product. I don't just mean the um, education finance report or the Friday forums, which of course are spectacularly beneficial. But I also mean the phenomenon that Tocqueville described, a kind of social and political space that allows for citizens to work on their own governance without an intermediary. A place and an experience that means we do know how to find each other again when collective problems require our attention. And City Club, actually fulfills that promise literally by being here year after year, by creating a formal space where, you know, really all you have to do is show up and you know that someone else will be there to talk to you about what you're, what you're worried about, what you're alarmed about, whether you're worried about no child left behind or the role of the initiative. City Club is here holding that place, helping citizens find one another in a very specific moment. But City Club also fulfills the Tocquevillian promise figuratively once all of us have had the experience of working collectively with another to solve a problem, even a problem that seems intractable, I mean, you heard tax reform, education finance, once you've come together to talk through those issues, we start to believe that we can do it somewhere else. We start to believe in the, in the power of participatory democracy and we take it outside of City Club and we have faith in the association, the idea of association itself. There are a tremendous number of examples of that as well. Um, a young City Club member, Tatiana Turdall, has become very involved in the neighborhoods, because, in the neighborhood associations because of her, her um, involvement in City Club, and not because they're directly substantively related, but just because she, the idea of association works for her. Jeff Knapp is leaving the research board to go on the board of the Bicycle Transportation Alliance. We know that our members become converts of a sort. They become participants in civil society through this, throughout this community 
through churches, synagogues, activist groups, arts organizations, neighborhood associations, and also, of course, in their workplace and in government. And this kind of transformation can't happen as an individual. It requires a collective. It requires an association. It requires a club that has an inside. And it requires us to hold that space. And so with that kind of value inherent in the idea of an organization that has an inside, I think it's important to think about what we can do to preserve the valuable things while struggling against the things that, are, um, that create the tension by having an outside. One of those things, I think, is a sort of fierce and unflinching reflectiveness. We need to be willing to ask ourselves over and over and again and again, what are we missing? Who are we leaving out? Where are our blind spots? And in this context, it's actually harder than you might think because you, we, all of us, are down here week after week doing good work. We're doing hard work. We're doing work that we don't have to do. We could be doing something else. So it's tempting to congratulate ourselves. It's tempting, and we should congratulate ourselves, but it's tempting to call things good enough, to settle for work that has holes in it, to, ask, to not ask ourselves the hard questions, because what we are doing is better than doing nothing. But that kind of complacency, and I'm not saying that we've, we've, we've adopted that kind of complacency, but we should guard against it, is what would allow us to become insular, looking only to what we know and being satisfied with that. We have to be fierce in reflecting on our role and that work. And I don't mean just me or the staff or the board, but all of us need to be fierce in that. And I want to give you an example of this from our history, and you've heard it now referred to a couple of times. Um, but I'll tell you, city clubs were founded all over the country around the same times that, our, that ours was. Shortly after the Industrial Revolution, people were trying to organize themselves in ways that made sense. And so all sorts of, of um, civic organizations were founded, including this one. And most of them, the majority of them, are dead. They don't exist at all. But almost worse, there are a number of them that have become moribund. They're just waiting for their last members to die, or they're sitting there sort of stunned, wondering how they fit into contemporary life. And City Club, this City Club, is one of the few that survived and, in fact, is in a kind of growth trajectory that's, um, that's growing in membership and influence. And I think there's one main reason why, and that is the fight over the admission of women to this organization. Not just the admission to the, uh, of women, but the fight over it. And many of you were here or participated in it, and I, I, I won't even uh, project on which side. <laughs> Um, but as you know, women began to agitate in earnest for admission in the early 1970s. And those agitators, you know them, Katz, Kafori, Lansing, Storrs, uh, many of the people who are uh, activists in this community still. This began a debate that took three votes and more than two years f um, until on the fourth vote women were finally admitted. This was a serious fight, and in many senses it was, it was bruising and relationship threatening. And I have to say, um, the last time I said Sid Lezak, he was still fighting with Gretchen Kifori over the strategy about how uh, women should have been admitted. And I think this organization is not only stronger for that fight, but survived because of it. And I don't mean just in the obvious ways. Of course, it's tremendously beneficial to the organization to have women become a part of it. And it expands the circle. It makes the inside bigger. And we're better for that. We have, better, you know, we have a, a, a bigger mix of... of thinking and minds, but we're also stronger and more resilient for having had the fight itself. Of course, there's always relief of having a big conflict and surviving at the end of it, but there's a kind of clarifying fire that comes from a struggle over the nature of an organization. City Club was forced to ask, what kind of organization are we? Who do we serve? Who do we need with us shoulder to shoulder to do the work? And by asking those hard questions and reflecting on them and then adapting once the answers became clear, this organization be learned, sort of taught itself to respond um, and has been relearning that lesson over and over. Obviously, we haven't had such an emotional period in a long time, but we've been, for the last at least three or four years, five years probably, um, in a time of deep reflection on the nature of civic engagement. When Patty Tillett was president right here, he and Heather Kometz and Gwen Milius asked the hard questions about what younger people want um, from civic engagement. And they also asked, how do you include younger people at the heart of the mission of the organization? And the organization had to be willing to adapt to that. Last year, we went through the painful process of ending um, decades of the issue committees. 
This was a program that the club had had, um, had for a long time that people had very meaningful civic experiences in by having small groups that met repeatedly. But things changed. The club evolved, the community evolved, and it wasn't working. So we ended them and we tried something new. And this, this kind of ongoing reflection and experimentation and result is essential to keep the organization relevant and also to keep the borders from calcifying around who's in and who's out. Now, as a result of the ongoing reflection, historical and current, the lines between members and non-members, in and out, are more blurred than ever. Nearly every event is open to the public, member or non-member, and Friday forums are obviously broadcast to thousands of people every week. Membership has essentially become a financial structure, a mechanism for those of us to choose to be inside to reach deeply and broadly into the public sphere. Looked at that way, the membership structure allows City Club to fund itself individually and collectively without, without having a funding structure that opens us up to accusations that somehow we're um, beholden to particular interests. Finally, I think as an organization, we continue to adapt in, in very healthy ways if we keep in front of us not just our organizational needs, but ask the question of what are the needs of this place? And by that I mean City Club and its members need to stay connected to the entire community and not just the members of the community who happen to be at this moment on the inside. I've never lived anywhere where people feel more connected to place than Portland, ever. Somehow we generate citizens and regenerate citizens and residents who have a sense of place, who feel a kind of ownership and responsibility for the built, for the built environment, for the natural world, for public spaces and civic institutions. They feel like they actually belong to them and that they're responsible for them. Now that does not mean that the citizens of Portland and the region are not critical. In fact, they are critical and they're more indignant about being left out of the process. They expect this tremendous place a lot, they expect a lot of this tremendous place and they expect a lot from its institutions, including this one, and from its government. In the world of mapping assets, the intense sense of place is tremendous. The connectedness or potential connectedness to the place can create a common ground where, uh, where they are otherwise not that obvious. No matter what the barrier, whether it be language or class or education, we have a common foundation, and that is a connection to Portland and the entire region. I return to this work, the work of this writer, Dan Chemis, over and over. Chemis was at one time the mayor of Missoula, Montana, and he wrote a book called Community and the Politics of Place, and it's on the magic shelf along with Democracy in America and Habits of the Heart in my office. And his central premise that the, is that the biggest threat to public life is disconnection from place, and that takes all sorts of forms. Last year, maybe many of you read this, there was an article in the New York Times about these up-and-coming managers in national companies. And what they're talking about are these bright, pe young, pe you know, very educated, mobile people who are, um, many of them, or most of them are in their 30s and 40s, who are moving up through companies. So say Verizon as an example. So a family goes and, and lives in Arizona, lives outside of Phoenix for a few years, and three years later, um, she becomes a regional manager and moves then to Denver, and then on, becomes the vice president and moves to Bethesda. And this is, a, not, you know, this is an unusual story, but here's the unusual part. Many, maybe most, of these people live in suburban communities that look identical to the suburb that they just left. There's the same restaurants, the same stores, the same gymboree class that the child was just in, is going, that, that child is going to an identical gymboree class um, in the other town. Now, of course, on one hand, it minimizes disruption for the families and it makes them feel um, a sort of sense of recognition. And it creates, it creates a kind of nat national culture in some, some odd sense. But it allows these families to have no connection to the particularities of a real place. And these people, according to the Times, sort of glide across the country without ever really knowing anything about the place where they land. And this occurs at a time when we need those people. We need their civic energy, we need their creativity, and they're talented, they're smart, they're educated, and they're raising kids, and they're not connected to place. In Chemist's words, public life can only be reclaimed by understanding and then practicing its connection to real identifiable place. In Portland, we have the advantage. We're connected to place. We feel connected to each other, to the food, the weather, the mountains, the neighborhoods, and it gives us a sense of common purpose from which we can ground ourselves and reach out to others. In that connection, in that celebration, we need to be clear-eyed and again ask the hard questions. 
What are we ignoring? Who are we leaving out? What are we mythologizing? And let me ask you this as an example. We tell ourselves and everybody else that downtown is the most vibrant and livable in America and that we saved it from urban blight. Is that still true? Who is it livable for? Who do you see outside the livability bubble? And that's just, that's just an example of these kinds of questions. In asking these questions, I'd like to challenge us to do it with our senses. So don't, ask, let, don't let the Oregonian tell you what to think about the condition of our community, or me, or OPB, or anybody else. But open your eyes and your ears. What do you smell? What do you hear? What's going on? And how can we make it better? And bring those real on-the-ground observations back here, back to City Club, and share those observations uh, with, with your fellow citizen and ask them to join you in addressing the real concerns. There's a poem I admire by the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova who had a very difficult life in Russia, but it grounds me in the sort of sensory aspects of our relationship to place. And so let me read it to you. It's not that long, don't worry. Um, it's called Our Own Land. We don't wear it in sacred amulets on our chests. We don't compose hysterical poems about it. It does not disturb our bitter dream sleep. It doesn't seem to be the promised paradise. We don't make of it a sole object for sale and barter. And we being sick, poverty-stricken, and unable to utter a word, don't remember about it. Yes, for us, it's mud on the galoshes. For us, it's crunch on teeth. And we mill, mess, and crush the dust and ashes that is not mixed up in anything, but will lie in it and be in it and that's why so freely we call it our own. That's what we should be asking as we're condu conducting our little version of reconnaissance. What is the mud on our galoshes? What is real in this place? Where's the grit and the dust? What do we as a populace need here and now? And let's ask those questions from the deepest, most real place we can. Let's tell each other what we discover. And that'll make this work, this work genuine, and that's what we can offer each other here. And then if we do that, the line between who's inside and who's outside will soften, and it'll expand to include anyone who wants to enter the circle. When I first wrote this talk, I ended here with a sort of summary of what we can do to answer these questions, to blur the lines so that we invite participation in City Club and in public life. And I want you to do those things. I want you to invite your neighbors and coworkers to join the conversation especially those who aren't participating or have some, uh, something that you disagree with or that, whose perspective isn't often heard. And this, when you're here at City Club, strike up a conversation with someone you don't know about something that matters to you. Tell them the truth. Listen to what they have to say to you. And use your senses to look at this place anew. What are we ignoring to our tremendous peril? And then use all that information to ask the hard questions, to challenge the organization, to spark a debate, or maybe even a fight. But I want to say one more thing in closing. We've all heard the American Express claim, membership has its privileges. And we've internalized that as a cultural me measuring stick. What's in it for me? And at City Club, we know the privileges of membership are not financial at all, and they can seem illusory. The privilege to ask a question of an elected official the privilege to study a constitutional amendment on behalf of our fellow citizens, the privilege to invite those who would purport to represent us to defend their views, the privilege to hold the door open for a fellow citizen as she enters to share her concerns. On bad days, those privileges, along with the $5 off lunch, can seem pretty minimal. But I challenge you to think again. I recently had a heated discussion with a city commissioner the question was whether City Club is an organization of privileged individuals. And I am telling you, I fought tooth and nail against that characterization. My ar argument is that City Club is, is, is made up of the salt of the earth, of people who basically, and the privileges of membership are basically the right to work really hard for no recognition. And boy, I believe that's true. I believe it's true. But I want to tell you this, in a room of friends, we are privileged. We're privileged to have the time to think about politics and policy rather than where our next meal is coming from. We're privileged to have the $16 to pay for lunch and the $165 or the $82.50 or whatever it is to join this organization. We're privileged to have the opportunity and the smarts, 
and the wherewithal and the education to dig into these issues. For us, unlike Akhmatova's we, we can lift our heads from the grit and the dust, and we can utter the words that need to be said, even if they're inartful. We're privileged to be able to sit here next to each other and trust that our neighbor will do the right thing. And we're privileged to be associated with this organization. American Express is right. Membership has its privileges, and we can't forget it. Now we need to exercise the responsibilities that go with them. Thank you.